Court now calls case number 17-13392, Ray Smith v. Patrick McFarland et al. Okay, we have multiple items on the docket, including a status conference and quite a few motions that are on the docket as well. But I want to start with getting everybody's appearances. And I will start with the plaintiffs to see who's here. And then before we address any motions, I'm going to have to address some issues about exactly who the parties are in this case, which is sort of an unusual starting point. But that's not clear. So, starting with the plaintiffs, who's here? Ray Smith, plaintiff. Okay. Barrett Kish. Okay. And for the defendants? Lori McAllister, Your Honor, for Auto Owners, Citizens, and Liberty Mutual. Okay. Aaron Levin for Director McFarland. Elizabeth Lippitt for Director McFarland. Okay. John Yeager for Michigan Farm Bureau. Todd Yeager-Sheff for USAA Insurance. And now, hold on, Mr. Yeager, you said you're for whom? Farm Bureau. Just one moment. Have you filed your appearance? The firm did. I think Kurt Hadley may have been listed as the lead counsel on it. Okay. Patrick Hennessey for State Farm. Okay. Adam Badley for the American Insurance Company and American Automobile Insurance Company. Okay. Can you hear everyone, Mr. Williams? All right. Good morning. Greg Kirchner on behalf of State Farm. And don't give me a test at the end. Anyone else? Mike Farrell, Your Honor, Progressive Casualty Insurance. Mr. Farrell, which firm are you from? Baker and Hostetler. Okay. Are you with Martin Weimer? Yes. I filed an appearance last week, I believe, last spring as well. Okay. And how do you spell your last name? F as in Frank, A-R-R-E-L-L. Just like it sounds. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Thank you very much. I will say if and when defendants' attorneys speak, I think I can keep it straight who the plaintiffs are, but I'm a little, you know, I'm not going to remember all your names, so I'm going to ask you to identify yourself on the record as you begin to speak so it's clear in any eventual transcript. All right. Well, let me start with Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith, are you a licensed attorney? No, sir. No, Your Honor. What about you, Mr. Kish? Are you a licensed attorney? No, I'm not. Okay. There are a number of other plaintiffs who are named in this pleading. There's a Mr. Archie. Is Mr. Archie here? No, he's not, Your Honor. Mr. Smith, have you spoken to Mr. Archie? Yes, I have. Is he aware of this proceeding? Yes, he was, as was Mr. Holmes. And Mr. Holmes is not here either? No, sir, Your Honor. How did Mr. Smith, how did you make Mr. Archie and Mr. Holmes aware of this proceeding? Through phone call. Did you send them copies of the notice of hearing? Yes, I did. How did you do that? Hand delivered. Do you know why Mr. Archie is not here? No, sir. Did he indicate that he was not planning to come? No, he didn't. That he couldn't come? Well, I hadn't talked to him this morning. I talked to him yesterday. And did he tell you whether he was going to come? He said he was going to appear today. He did? Yes, he did. All right, if he shows up, be sure to let me know. Sure, yes, sir, Your Honor. Okay. 
And uh, what about Mr. Holmes? Did he, did, when did you last speak to him? I talked to Mr. Holmes over the weekend. Well, I wasn't able to talk to him the last day or so. Did he indicate whether he planned to come today? Yes, he did. And did he say he was coming? He said he would try to make it. He would try? Yes. Does he understand he's required to be here? Uh, I believe he does, yes. Sir. Okay. Does Mr. Archie understand he's required to be here? Yes, sir. All right. Let me know if Mr. Archie shows up, please. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Kish, are you able to shed any further light on the, the presence or rather the absence of Mr. Archie and Mr. Holmes? Uh, no. There, I don't know them. You don't know them? No. Mr. Smith, who is Mr. Archie? Uh, he's a, uh, a Detroit motorist. A Detroit motorist? Yes, he is. What does that mean? He, he resides in Detroit. Well, that doesn't make him a motorist. There are a lot of Detroit pedestrians, aren't there? According to um, the state code, insurance code, that uh, he is an individual that acquired or tried to acquire an affordable auto insurance policy. How do you know that? Because we discussed it. Did you prepare the complaint, Mr. Smith? Uh, yes, I did. Are you the did you you the sole person who compare, uh, prepared this complaint? Well, uh, I mean, Mr. Kiss, we discussed it, but I, comp I, I actually did the writing. You the actually writing. drafted it? Yes, I did. Did you actually draft the documents that were required to commence this lawsuit? Yes, I did. Did you do that with any help, or did you do that on your own? Oh, my own, sir. On your own. So you're the person who filled in all the addresses for the parties? Uh, yes, I did. I noticed that they all have an address of 400 Renaissance Center Drive, 2600 Detroit, Michigan, 48243. Yes. Do you know what that address is? Yes, I do. What is that address? Uh, that's the address of our office, my office. Your office? Yes. Uh, when you say your office, what do you mean? You mean your personal office with your name on it, or is there some entity that has that office address? Uh, my name on it. And what do you do for a living? Uh, we work with a uh, youth youth program, skills trade, educational programs, literacy program. So your office is at 400 Renaissance Center Drive, 2600 Detroit? Yes, it is. Is there a name on that office besides your name? Uh, the Literacy Center. Sorry? The Literacy Center. Now, the court cannot help but notice that pretty much everything that's ever sent out to Mr. Kish, excuse me, to Mr. Holmes or Mr. Archie has been returned. Yes. Okay. And all those things were sent out at the address that you gave the court, 400 Renaissance Center Drive, 2600. Yes. Are Mr. Archie and Mr. Holmes at that address? No, they're not. Then why did you give the court that address? Uh, because I was under the impression that all the mail should appear at one address. Well, you understood that the court wanted to know the address of the parties so the court could reach parties. You understand that? Yes. And so you're telling me that Mr. Archie and Mr. Holmes are not at that address? Uh, no. How did you expect the court to be able to communicate with these supposed parties to this lawsuit? Uh, through me, sir. Huh? Through me. I mean, I was going to, I informed everybody of the date. Okay. Do you understand that um, you, it is the unauthorized practice of law for you to be representing others in court? Uh, I'm not representing no one but myself. Well, you just said that the court would communicate with these people through you. Why should the court do that? Well, it was my understanding that I would uh, relay all the documents to the uh, plaintiffs. Well, then why is everything getting returned? I'm not sure. Have you been writing return to sender on these documents as they come in? No. I believe there was an issue with the uh, office secretary. 
Do you know the actual address for Mr. Archie? I don't have it off the top of my head. Well, do you have it on a piece of paper somewhere, something you brought with you? Uh, no, sir. So you're not able to tell the court the actual address for Mr. Archie? Uh, no, sir. And he doesn't have an office at 400 Renaissance Center Drive? No, sir. In fact, he has no presence there at all, correct? No, sir. Is that also true for Mr. Holmes? You don't know his address? Not off the top of my head, sir. Well, besides off the top of your head, do you have it written on a piece of paper or available to you right now? No, not with him right now. But he doesn't live or have an office at 400 Renaissance Center Drive? No, sir. Do you have a phone number for Mr. Archie? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, what is it? It's in my phone. I can bring my phone in, sir. Okay, so you don't have it with it's you? Dormant. No, I don't. And do you have a, a phone number for Mr. Holmes? Uh, it's stored in my phone, sir. So you don't have that with you either? No, I don't. Mr. Kish, you don't know either Mr. Holmes or Mr. Archie? No, I don't. So you don't have their addresses or phone numbers, do you? No. What about email addresses, uh, Mr. Smith? Do you have Mr. Archie or Mr. Holmes' email addresses? Uh, no, I don't. Not only, sir. Not with me. Do you have them at all? Anywhere? Uh, yes, I do. Why should the court have to communicate with Mr. Archie and Mr. Holmes through you? I can't uh, give you a definite answer on that, but it was my understanding that we would do a uh, follow meetings between me and the plaintiffs. Yeah, well, I'm going to need a definite answer to that because uh, you can't represent them. And I need to communicate. I meaning the court, needs to be able to communicate with parties in this case, as do the defendants. Has any defendant who's in the courtroom been able to successfully send anything in the mail to Mr. Holmes or Mr. Archie? If so, please let me know. I hear no one. Show of hands, has any defendant in this courtroom had mail sent that was sent to Mr. Archie and Mr. Holmes returned? Okay, it looks like I've got about a half a dozen hands up. Thank you. Let me ask you about Americans for Reform. Yes, sir. At docket number 69, page 6, you said that it's an activist group, not a corporation. Is that correct? That's correct, sir. What does that mean? What is an activist group? An activist group is a um, uh, collection of individuals um, that pretty much uh, advocate or uh, discuss issues of injustice, um, come up with a collection of um, uh, decisions to how, how do we address these issues of injustice uh, when it comes to um, public schools, uh, foreclosures, uh, water shutoffs, anything that relates to a community injustice. So it's a discussion forum. Is that a fair way to describe it? I would say, uh, I mean, you could say a discussion forum, but uh, we would more so go into uh, a how we define, for instance, like Black Lives Matter. Uh, Black Lives Matter would be something more of a, uh, of a form of platform uh, to discuss issues, uh, to advocate for issues, uh, peaceful protests in that form. Does it have officers? Uh, no, it does not, sir. Does it have directors? No, sir. Is it incorporated? No, it's not, Your Honor. Is it a limited liability company? No, it's not, Your Honor. Is it a partnership? No, it's not. Is it a limited partnership? No, it's not, Your Honor. Is it an assumed name for anything? No. So as far as you know, there's been no assumed name filing for, and I'm going to, from this point on, I suppose... I could refer to it as uh, AFR. Do you refer to it as AFR? When you say AFR, can you tell me what? It's Americans that? for Reform, isn't it? Uh, yes. Okay. Do you ever you never refer to it as AFR? No, I have not, sir. Okay. Well, Americans for Reform has it filed 
a doing business as or assumed name registration anywhere? No, it's not, sir. Has a website? Uh, yes, it does. The court will take judicial notice. Well, let me ask you. Is the website americansforreform.org? Yes, it is. And the court will take judicial notice of the existence of the website, which the court has looked up. The website claims that it is able to receive tax-deductible contributions. Is that right? I, it's not a tax-deductible organization. It's not a 501c3. Okay. Uh, so. so just donations? Yes, I believe. So I'll stand corrected if the website doesn't say that they're tax-deductible. And does it, in fact, receive donations? Uh, no, it has not, sir. Are there any members in Americans for Reform? No, not what, what, what we would call when we say members. Uh, there's not a uh, sign-up sheet. Uh, there's not a, uh, an enrollment process. There's not a registration process. So when we say members, um, I can't say that there are members, uh, definitely, but I can say that uh, we are a group of individuals that come together to speak on injustice issues. How many people are we talking about? On average? On average, um, probably maybe 50 to 60 people. How often does it meet? Uh, we meet at different uh, aspects as far as protests. Um, different, we attend different community meetings. Uh, there's not a um, particular uh, set time and schedule or, or a uh, date to meet uh, when there is an issue that uh, we feel that uh, there's an injustice taking place. Uh, we just meet. Do you understand that Americans for Reform as uh, a collective entity cannot appear in this court without an attorney? Yeah, what I, I understand that um, we can't, I can't represent Americans for Reform. But, I mean, I don't, if you can't, then who is? Uh, no one, sir. Who signed the complaint on behalf of Americans for Reform? Uh, I did, sir. You said you understand that you can't represent it. Can you tell me why you can't represent it? Well, it was brought to my attention that um, acting pro se, uh, I'm not able to represent a corporation. Um, it is my knowledge that America for Reform is not a corporation. Um, so at that point, I realized that I'm not able to represent a corporation. But as I stated, uh, America for Reform is not a corporation or a legal entity. You understand you cannot represent other people? Yes, I do, sir. Okay, and there's only one person in Americans for Reform that you can represent, and that would be yourself. You understand that? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, but when you sign the complaint on behalf of Americans for Reform, you're intending to sign on behalf of a group of people, aren't you? Yes, I believe so. Do you have a role or a title within Americans for Reform? Uh, no, there is no particular role or particular um, staff uh, holding any titles or offices. Is it fair to say that you are the leader? Well, there's no leader in Americans for Reform, Your Honor. I, I can't say that. Um, I wouldn't say that, sir. Who organizes the meetings? 
uh, the meetings are just organized by different other advocates. advocates. Americans for Reform is not really um, an entity that says, okay, now we're going to establish a meeting uh, today or we're going to establish a meeting uh, next next week. Where does it meet? Americans for Reform is yeah. it, it's not. It's, I believe that what I'm understanding that you're saying that it is a established corporation. No, I'm not saying that. You you said it isn't. I'm I'm. But you have said it's some sort of a collective advocacy group, and, and that see, they meet together from time to time. So where do they do that? We don't. It, we don't meet under Americans for Reform. There's a meeting to take place, for instance, uh, with the protests at um, uh, Michigan State. Okay. We go up there, a, a lot of collective activists meet there, but it's not per se America's for reform. Okay, who organizes it to go to Michigan State or wherever it's going to protest so that everyone gets, the, the word gets out and everyone knows where to go and when to be there? Yeah, I mean, the word just gets out. I mean, through email. Just, uh, through, who sends uh, the email? Well, there's a, a email uh, listing that who's ever uh, going to lead the protest. They'll just email uh, individuals. I see. So anyone who's in this loose organization can send out an email to a list serve of some sort or a group listing and say, uh, let's go protest at Michigan State, something like that? Yes. Okay. Uh, is there notice done through I, I, the website indicates that it's got Facebook as well. Is that right? Yes, it does. All right. Who operates the Facebook page? Uh, at this point in time, uh, no one's operating the Facebook page. Uh, is Facebook used to give notice of events or protests? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay, what about at some other time? No, I haven't. Is the website used to communicate? Uh, no, sir. Who owns the domain of the website? Uh, I set it up, sir. You do? Yes. How long has it been in existence? The website, uh, would no, say... No, the organization or the group, well, Americans well, for Reform. Well, I can't say it's uh, it's an entity, but I know the website was, uh, I believe, uh, set up sometime, I believe, early July. Of 2017? 17. And actually, Your Honor, um, Americans for Reform was set up as an idea, um, to bring people together, um, there is what I would call a work in progress. Uh, at some point in time, we would look uh, to organize it uh, as an entity uh, to actually have enroll members uh, and move forward. At this point in time, uh, it was just an idea uh, to collectively bring people together uh, to stand up for injustices anywhere and everywhere. Okay. So well. it's, it's not. It wasn't. It's not. It wasn't. At the point in time, uh, the idea was to have established in the future, but to have a collective idea, thought, and things of that nature. So at this point, uh, we're looking, I'm looking at uh, establishing as a legal entity, but we don't have, I don't have a, a, a set time and date to do all those things. Does anyone own the name or the trademark? In this case, actually, service mark to be more accurate. Americans for Reform. It's not trademark, Your Honor. It's not registered. No, it's not. Is is that name registered with any governmental entity at all? No, it's not, Your Honor. Not as I know of. For the record, not as I know of. In several places in your filings, Mr. Smith, you've written the words at all next to plaintiffs. You've listed the named plaintiffs, the four Smith, Kish, Archie, Holmes, and AFR. When I say AFR, it's just my short version of Americans for Reform. And then you've said at all. Who's the at all? Uh, the at all would 
include um, individuals, uh, myself, uh, Mr. Kish, uh, Mr. Holmes, and others. Um, we have a lot of, uh, we had just talked with uh, uh, several individuals. Yeah, that's rather vague. Who exactly are the individuals that you're referring to when you say at all? Are you saying everyone who's involved in this Americans for Reform, or are you thinking of particular individuals? Well, I can't say that everybody is particularly involved with Americans for Reform. What I can say that uh, the individuals uh, express the interest of being part of the lawsuit. Sir. Can you name any of those individuals besides, well, I'm going to get to Mr. Holmes and Mr. Archie, but other than the people whose names actually appear on these pleadings, uh, four people, yes. who is the at all? Uh, there will be a uh, Michelle Hickson, and I'll do a night, um, uh, Avon Favors. And we kind of, uh, in the three stages, we kind of left it open for those individuals that uh, we had met with in prior meetings uh, to discuss their interest in the uh, lawsuit. Okay. Um, soon after this uh, hearing, um, I'm going to order right now, and um, you're going to have one week from today's date to do it. You're going to have to produce uh, and serve on all parties copies, or excuse me, uh, the addresses, telephone numbers, and email addresses for Mr. Archie and Mr. Holmes. So you've got five business days or seven calendar days in which to do that, since you have told the court that you have that information, and this court and the parties apparently are unable to reach these people who have been named in the complaint. Yes. Um, and then, assuming that they don't arrive before the end of this hearing, I'm also going to, once I have their addresses, I'm going to issue show cause orders for them to appear in front of me and explain why this case should not be dismissed as to them. Excuse me, are you say dismissed as to them individuals? or I'm going to show cause. I'm going to issue a show cause order once I have some basis for actually reaching Mr. Archie and Mr. Holmes. Uh, to have them come and appear and explain why the case should not be dismissed as to them. Not the case in total. Well, that we're going to deal with in the mo pending motions. Yes. Okay. And excuse me, Your Honor, and you want me to submit the information within five days? Yes. Well, five business days, so one week from today. So do I mail the information to the court or... Um, to the clerk, or how would I? I, I want you to file that information with the court. Okay. And, well, what's going to happen, I think every defendant is an electronic, is an e-filer, right? So once it gets scanned in by the court, you should all get notice of it automatically. So we'll leave it at that. I want you to file it with the court, um, the addresses, phone numbers, and email addresses of Mr. Archie and Mr. Holmes. That'd be no problem, Your Honor. Now, do Mr. Archie and Mr. Holmes know that they've been named as plaintiffs in this lawsuit? Uh, yes, sir. When did they learn that? Uh, at the time that I actually filed the documents, and we discussed that prior to me filing the documents, that they would be interested in uh, being a plaintiff in the suit, sir. Do they know that you purport to be acting on their behalf? I can't uh, say yes, but they know that I uh, am the lead uh, activist in this suit, sir.
Let's talk about the complaint. And that would be docket item number one. Or at least it should be. And it is. Filed on October 17th, 2017. Page six of the complaint. There are two signatures. Whose are they? On page six. Should be mine. And Mr. Kish. So the signature, it appears to be Ray Smith. Did you actually sign that, Mr. Smith? Uh, yes. Mr. Kish, the signature that says, has your, uh, above your name, is that your signature? Did you actually sign it? Uh, no. Who signed it? I, mean, I could have signed it. I need to see it. You don't have it? I have page six. So I have, have a copy of Okay, great. One of the defense counsel will show it to you. Oh, yeah. That's your signature. Yeah. Absolutely. So you each signed for yourselves? Yes. Okay. Now, on page, there's a brief attached to it. At the end of that brief, page 18, there are two more signatures. One of them over Ray Smith et al. And uh, let me ask you, Mr. Smith, is that your signature over on page 18 of the brief that was filed uh, with yes, the complaint? It is. Yes, it will be, sir. Okay. And why did you, uh, when you signed it as Ray Smith plaintiff et al., on whose behalf were you signing? Uh, I believe I was signing on behalf of um, everyone, sir. Everyone meaning whom? Uh, Mr. Holmes, um, Mr. Um, First Air Archie, and all the other um, potential plaintiffs. On behalf because, of the potential plaintiffs. Because as we were, um, it was my understanding, Your Honor, that uh, we will leave this um, complaint open um, for anyone that wants to actually take part in the suit. Uh, that was my understanding of how I understood the law in filing a uh, civil action. Um, I may have been wrong about that, but that was my understanding, that I could uh, leave the uh, action open um, for those who uh, may want to get involved in the suit. I didn't understand that it would be a uh, cutoff time for individuals to join the suit, so that's why I signed it as I did. About you, Mr. Mr. Kish, page 18 of the brief that was filed with the complaint. There's a signature yeah. over your name. It says Barrett Kish, plaintiff at all. I don't have that. Yeah. Someone have a copy? They, they, they can show him? Yeah, I just signed some stuff. He said, you know, are you with me? And I said, oh, I'm with you all the way. So you signed that? Passionate about, yes. Now, when... What's Hold on, let me ask Mr. Kish. Mr. Kish, when you signed that as Barrett Kish, plaintiff at all, for whom were you signing? 
I guess I should have read it a little more in depth. Um, I was under the impression that um, it was just to, for us to come and appear today and that I am going to be here and show up and that I support Ray and what he's doing and um, trying to bring some justice to uh, the people of Detroit. Now, when you said you should have read it a little better, let me ask you, did you read it at all before you signed it? I have a I have a, a bad habit of just overviewing everything and trusting, and I, yeah, you're, I, I read it partially. I, like, go over a little bit at a time. I have, like, dyslexia sometimes. Okay, so you, you skimmed the brief before you signed it? Yeah. But you didn't read it cover to cover? I read... Uh, the arguments, I uh, read some of the arguments. We've been studying a lot. I've been reading a lot, but I haven't read everything. What about the complaint? Did you read the complaint before you signed it? The first one or the second one? The, the only one right now that's been accepted by this court, the first one, the one that you were shown your signature on a few moments ago. You don't have that see, I, I didn't see my signature on this one that I received. That's, that's the, uh, the response. But the, uh, the complaint. Response. Remember the attorney came and kindly showed you your signature on the complaint? Argument. Yeah, I, I read over yeah. one, two, three, four, and five, five of the arguments of the um, the defendants, and uh, then went to determine uh, what exactly you know, trying to figure out what they meant, and studied that, um, and what what we can say to respond and. Uh, what they meant by, you know. Okay. The court is going to the court is going to issue a ruling with respect to the brief. Motions are governed by Federal Rule of Civil Procedure seven and Local Rule seven point one, and briefs are, uh, excuse me, pleadings are governed by Rule eight. This uh, brief has been referred to in the plaintiff's most recent filings as being separate from the complaint. And I specifically cite to docket entry number 69 at uh, page 5. That brief is not in support of any motion and is not in the form of a pleading. And so the court is going to strike it as violative of Rule 7 because it is a brief with no motion to support and as violative of Rule 8 because it is not a proper pleading. It is simply an argument and in some fashion a tutorial on the law. It does not, however, give the defendants notice of the claims against them. The complaint may or may not give them notice. And the complaint, as styled as a complaint, will remain. Also, this brief does not cure any defects that I can tell in the complaint. So to be clear, open the document. In docket number one, from page ID eight through the end of docket number one is stricken for the reasons I just stated. I'm sorry, that's through page ID number 28. 
because after that comes a cover sheet. More accurately, that's the page ID number 20. Twenty-seven. From twenty-eight on begins the cover sheet, which shall remain in the pleadings. And the new lawsuit checklist and so forth. But the portion of it that's characterized as a brief is stricken. All right. Let me just ask generally of the defendants, um, I've asked uh, plaintiffs a uh, long series of questions about Americans for Reform. Do any of the defendants have any light to shed on this group or organization that would, the court ought to be aware of? Uh, Your Honor, the only thing that... Well, identify yourself, please. I'm sorry. Lori McAllister, Your Honor. Um, <clears throat> There was an effort made to identify this as a legal entity through uh, LARA, the Michigan uh, Licensing and Regulatory Authority. Uh, it wasn't licensed there, so we unfortunately were not able to shed any additional light on this uh, group of people. Okay, well, Mr. Smith admits that it's not incorporated, right. and I will take judicial notice of the lack of a, a record in LARA and a note that the court has made the same effort that you have, and so I can confirm that there is no business entity registered with LARA, and that is a, a government website. So under Rule 201 of the Federal Rules of Evidence, I'll take judicial notice of that. All right. Uh, that gets us, I believe, just one moment. All right. I have uh, read the briefs, of which there are many, but there are a number of motions to dismiss that have been filed, and uh, I will start, and I'm not going to need a lot of oral argument. I think it's extensively briefed. Uh, I've read the response as well. And um, the reply to the extent that there were replies filed. I would like, uh, we'll start with docket number 43, Patrick McFarland's motion to dismiss. And if you could come up to the podium, that'd be great. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, I'm Aaron Levin for Director McFarland. Uh, yes. Other than to say that with the uh, brief attached to the complaint now being struck, the complaint doesn't contain any allegations relating to Director McFarland. Yes. But that aside, I'm going to rely on my brief, and unless you have any questions, that's all I have today. Okay. Um, let me ask you this. Um, could you just address uh, two things? One is the exhaustion of administrative remedies argument. Just uh, when I say address it, just... I'll address it. If you could just say something about that, I'd appreciate it. Um, Your Honor, I, I left my packet at my desk, at the table. So if I could go grab that. Just well, sure. If you're going to read from the brief, don't bother. Well, yeah, but I, if I you have more to say. I, I don't have any more to add that's, that's in our brief on that. I don't believe we spent a ton of time on it, um, other than to say that I don't believe it's been done. Okay, let me just see. I might have another question for you. Page four of your reply brief, you referred to this as an unopposed motion to dismiss. Although I did get a response motion from we refer to Mr. Smith. Un... Uh, yeah, Your Honor, we refer to it as unopposed because the response was three weeks late because uh, there was no extension granted as it related to Director McFarland's. Brief. Okay, because my briefing schedule just applied to the other briefs. Yes. Okay. Well, the court is going to excuse that because I can understand that the plaintiff may have been confused in in thinking that. Uh, he could respond to all the briefs on my briefing schedule, and he apparently looks like he did. So I will accept his response as to your client, even though it was late, 
then I say his, um, I'm talking about Mr. Smith and Mr. Kish, I guess. Um, I think only Mr. Smith signed it, however. Um, so um, I'll accept that response, but I, I hear what you say, and I also note what you had to say about the lack of allegations against Mr. McFarlane uh, with the brief having been stricken. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do you have anything, Mr. Smith, uh, I, I, you may stay where you are if you have anything you want to say about the motion to dismiss Mr. McFarlane. Uh, yes, I do, uh, Your Honor. Are you gonna, and Mr. Kish, do you have anything to say or is it all going to be Mr. Smith? Um, I have a few things. Okay, so Mr. Smith. Well, we believe that, um... The director, uh, McFarland, uh, he is um, instrumental in the um, unconstitutional uh, rate setting, sir, according to the statute. Um, the director, he's approved the, uh, the rates, the unconstitutional rates set by the, the insurance companies. Um, the director um, and insurance companies, uh, working together uh, to determine uh, what uh, motorists or what group of motorists as far as territorial zip codes or what they are charged. Um, the director and insurance companies are uh, instrumental in uh, establishing the uh, insurance, uh, automobile, I'm sorry, the Michigan Automobile Insurance uh, Placement Facility. Um, the director, Only in the sense that he approves rates that have been applied for or filed, right? Uh, if I understand this correctly. Well, what, 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 we're find, what we found out is that he is complicit into uh, the unconstitutional uh, rate setting uh, in terms of no-fault auto insurance. Even if he does, though, he's doing all that acting in his official capacity, is he not? Uh, we believe that uh, he's acting discriminatorial in his, uh, in his practice as far as uh, establishing the rates uh, with insurance companies. We believe that uh, the No Fault Auto Insurance Act is a, a right for motorists uh, because it is a imposed uh, statute on motorists. That means that motorists are required to purchase auto insurance uh, when it, in terms of uh, registering a motor vehicle. Uh, we believe that uh, the rating system itself is unconstitutional and discriminatory, sir, and we believe that the director uh, understands this and he is complicit uh, in, to, in, in pro approving these unconstitutional practices. So we feel that he is part of the problem, sir, uh, because he has the power to stop the unconstitutional practices when it comes to rate setting, auto insur auto automobile insurance uh, uh, rates. What claims are you intending to make against Mr. McFarlane? Well, we feel that um, he has the uh, the power uh, to stop the unconstitutional practices, sir. Well, what unconstitutional practices? What portion of the Constitution? Uh, the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment. Well, the Fifth Amendment doesn't apply because it uh, applies to the federal government, not the state government. So um, the Fourteenth, you say? Yes. Which clause is in the 14th? Uh, equal protection, sir. Equal protection. Okay. Now, All right. continue. Yes, briefly. Uh, we feel that uh, motorists have a protected interest um, when it comes to due process. Um, in terms of the statute talks about Affordability, sir, Your Honor. Um, but isn't there an administrative process um, by which you could have protested this through the state government? Well, and and they, they've said that you failed to exhaust administrative remedies, among other things. And well, if they and haven't said it, one of the insurance companies has said it. Exactly. And, and, I'll, and I'll finally, sir, Your Honor, um, the administrative 
remedy process uh, to us uh, would be futile because uh, the state Supreme Court in Shavers versus uh, Attorney General has already addressed. Shavers 1 you're talking about? Pardon? Shavers 1? Uh, Shavers 42, Michigan 554. But wasn't there Shavers 2? Yes, it was. We looked okay. at it. Shavers. Right. Uh, the Shavers versus Attorney General, uh, I believe this is uh, Shavers 1. Because I believe. Hey, well, doesn't the Shavers 2 essentially gut the holding that you're relying on in Shavers 1 or modify it such that it doesn't apply? I think Shavers 2 uh, went to address the issue as far as uh, that the state should provide an alternative uh, means for uh, motors to acquire uh, no fault auto insurance. Uh, Shavers 1, is my understanding, addressed the issue of that no fault auto insurance is mandatory, uh, but there's issues with the law itself, how it will be how it will be delivered. Um, it must be delivered uh, affordable. It must be delivered uh, equitable. It must be delivered uh, non-discriminatory. Now, we feel that at this point in time, uh, none of those uh, requirements have been met. We feel that uh, insurance is a right. Uh, we also feel that uh, the ins auto insurance uh, has imposed unjust burdens on motorists, in particular motorists in Detroit and territorial zip codes that consist of 85% of minorities. Um, we also feel that the director uh, is complicit in uh, uh, setting these unconstitutional or approving these unconstitutional uh, biases. Uh, based on our study as far as comparison, when you compare uh, motors in uh, West Bloomfield opposed to a motors in uh, Detroit, uh, there is a significant um, disparity in pricing, and we feel that the director understands this because it is a known fact that Detroit motors are paying the highest insurance risk in the country. Uh, it is a fact that uh, there's a large majority of Detroiters who are living under the... Uh, let me, let me just stop you there, though, because yes. you didn't answer my question. My question was about your administrative remedy and why should the courts be involved as opposed to going to an administrative agency in the state of Michigan or to the state legislature? Well, Your Honor, we, we feel that, particularly myself, that the, court, the, the, the administrative process is unable to um, address a constitutional violation. Uh, we feel that the administrative process uh, will not give us the relief that's needed um, in terms of the unconstitutional biases. I believe that the administrative process addressed the issue as far as, for instance, um, if I move to a different zip code, then I could uh, submit a, a document that says, oh, Hello, uh, excuse me, a document that says that uh, my insurance should be lower because I moved to a different zip code because you're rating me on my zip code. Okay. So, but we feel that they, the, the administrative process is, is unable to address a constitutional issue. Okay. Any, anything uh, from you, Mr. Kish? Um, yeah, the same, that uh, if we had have gone through other channels, they don't have, have the authority to um, look at, 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 to decide the constitutionality of what we're talking about. So it would have been futile. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, docket number 43 is taken under advisement because it will have to be dealt with by report and recommendation. <laughs> docket number 45 is the insurance defense joint motion to dismiss Hopefully not everyone in the courtroom is going to argue this, but who is? <laughs> and let me just say before you start, um, because I've been thinking here on the bench about what I previously said about show causing the other plaintiffs, I, I am going to continue my order 
that the information regarding the other plaintiffs needs to be submitted to the court within a week. But I have reconsidered it. I'm not going to issue a show cause as to them. I'm going to, based on the record we have now, I think I know what I need to know. So I don't think I would learn anything more by having them appear. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Lori McAllister, and I drew the short straw, so I'm going to appear on the insurance defendant's joint motion. Maybe it's the long straw. I always liked arguing in court. With respect to the arguments, it's obvious that the court has reviewed the pleadings very carefully, and we are very comfortable standing on the briefs that we have submitted to the court that we think have addressed the issues. I would note, Your Honor, that I think the information submitted this morning with respect to Americans for Reform not being any kind of entity, as well as the information on Mr. Holmes and Mr. Archie, fully supports dismissing those plaintiffs out of the case. But we believe that as to the remaining two plaintiffs, that their case should also be dismissed for the reasons that we have set forth in the brief that we have submitted to the court. If the court has any particular questions for us, I'd be happy to address those. Very briefly, if you could address the filed rate doctrine, please. Yes. Just explain it a little bit. This doctrine, Your Honor, grows out of sort of the same tree trunk as primary jurisdiction and those kind of doctrines which recognize that the courts are not experienced in technical matters such as insurance rate making. And therefore... You think I don't like making insurance rates, really? Okay. I know I would not want to do it 24 hours a day, Your Honor, so I'm glad my friends who are actuaries enjoy that sort of thing. But with respect to that type of technical issue, there is an administrative body that has been designated by the state of Michigan with jurisdiction over rate making. They have a statute that they are required to enforce. They have a mechanism by which an appeal can be filed. So our position is, Your Honor, that given that what they are challenging here is rates that are on file and that have been applied by the defendants pursuant to their filed rating plans, that there is not a justification for them to bring this case before the court. If their remedy, if any, should be to go to the insurance department, exhaust their remedy there, and pursue it. Whether it comes under the rubric of primary jurisdiction, filed rate doctrine, or exhaustion of administrative remedies, we believe you get to the same point, which is that the court should not be involved in technical rate making, and that should be deferred to the appropriate body. And one of the decisions, excuse me, Your Honor, that we cited in our brief is the McGleechee v. Brissa West decision, which was one of my cases where the issue was raised about Chapter 21 of the insurance code, how we were setting rates, whether the rates were appropriate, and the judge in the Western District who was affirmed on appeal said, look, this is not something that the courts should be involved in. This is rate making. This is where the administrative agency has the specialized expertise, and that's where this should go. Okay. Well, you've answered my second question, which was about exhaustion of administrative remedies. And maybe I'll just ask a follow-up. Exactly which agency should they have gone to, the insurance bureau? Yes, Your Honor. That's what I call it because I'm old, but the technical name is the Department of Insurance and Financial Services. And Financial Services. Okay. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Mr. Smith? Yes, Your Honor. Anything you want to say on this? Yes, Your Honor. I have a question. Sure, Your Honor. You were of a single case in the United States that has permitted a lawsuit to go forward on the theory that you're pursuing here? Your Honor, what we're, in terms of the exhaustion of remedies? No, in terms of suing the insurance companies and suing the state government for rate making. 
and for discriminatory, alleged discriminatory practices with respect to zip codes? In, in um, Sabres, Your Honor, um, versus Attorney General, what we're uh, heavily relying on, um, the rates. Shavers won. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, the, Your Honor, the, the, the law says, the statute says that um, the rates cannot be excessive. Uh, it also talks about the rates must be affordable. They must be equitable. Uh, they must be um, equitable, affordable, non-discriminatory. And which we're, we're, we're having a hard time in our research uh, find out what's affordable. Um, the state never uh, declared or emphasized on what was affordable. But that's that's a very subjective standard, isn't it? I mean, it, what's affordable to one person might not be affordable to another. Well, well it's like um, a bottle of wine, Your Honor. Uh, a person uh, may buy a bottle of wine over, over dinner pay $5. Uh, another, another individual may purchase a, a bottle of wine at $1,000. Um, take, for instance, the Affordable Care Act. Uh, the Affordable Care Act has index of, of what's affordable um, for a family of three or a family of five or individual, and it, and it determines what the individual will pay for that benefit. Uh, but how is that discriminatory? I mean, we... we well, some some African Americans who live in the city of Detroit can afford it. Some can't. In this this court, we have several judges who live in the city of Detroit. Some white, some African American. Presumably, they can afford it. Um, how does it become discriminatory well, that okay. some people can and some people can't? For instance, um, we we'll take a motorist in West Bloomfield, uh, opposed to a motorist in Detroit. Uh, that motorist in West Bloomfield. Particularly, we would say both uh, males at 42 years of age, um, same uh, vehicle, uh, 2,000 uh, pickup truck, uh, same coverage, um, liability-only policy with no collision or comprehensive coverage, meaning that the insurance company uh, is not will not be exposed to any risk because if something happens to that particular vehicle, whether it's in Detroit or West Bloomfield, uh, the insurance company have no risk to uh, pay for damages to that vehicle. So based on liability-only policy, why would the individual or the motorist in West Bloomfield have a significant lower price or lower rate than the same driver having the same criteria with the same vehicle pay at astronomical higher rate. So we find, or it, it, it is our understanding that that's discriminatory because they have this, they mean the same factors, same vehicle, uh, same age, same driving record, liability only policy where the insurance companies have no risk to damage. Why is that individual allow to pay a significant lower price when it comes to insurance. Well, if you had pursued your, your administrative remedies, you might have gotten that background information or done a FOIA request perhaps under Freedom of Information Act. You might have gotten that information and found out the answer to that. Perhaps uh, the actuarial information is available or the backup information is available. Uh, and so... You might have found that out, what, what the reason is, but we can't just jump to the conclusion that it must be discriminatory, even though we don't know or understand it. Uh, am I correct? Uh, I, I take uh, what you say uh, as being true, but we have a different understanding of uh, what's affordable and what's discriminatory. Um, now, you, you've mentioned racial lines in some of your filings, I believe. Um, is that what you're saying is the, is the fault line on discrimination, or is it poverty, or well, what well, is the, it? The fault line is uh, risk, exposure. The fault line would be more so why is the driver living in a 
different territory paying a significant lower rate when the insurance companies have no risk there. If, for instance, it's, 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 it's a, um, a known thing or talked about discussion, you drive a car, you leave a car in the church, it's going to get stolen or it's going to be vandalized. But that's fine. It could be true. But we're saying that if the individual motorist or driver only have a liability policy, whether this car gets stolen in, in Hamtramck, West Bloomfield, Auburn Hills, Detroit, there's no risk. Because there's so, no replacement. Yes. Mm -hmm. So why, is, why would the driver in a territory or zip code in Detroit pay double what a driver or motorist would pay in West Bloomfield? Now, why, for us, the rating scheme is unconstitutional and biased? Because but have you taken this, have you gone to Lansing and gone to any administrative agency and made the very same arguments? And you speak very well, sir. I mean, you, you speak very cogently. Um, and uh, I believe that you wish to see justice. But have you gone to Lansing and addressed this? in a different tribunal rather than this federal court. But Your Honor, is, if yeah, we, yes or no, have you? No, sir, Your Honor. Okay. No. All right. I, I've, any other cases besides Shavers? In terms of... That have ever, in your view, upheld this type of action? Well, for, in, my, in our research, Your Honor, um, the insurance companies, Your Honor, is, is in the unique situation uh, when they passed the McCarran-Ferguson Act. It is, um, for us, is that the insurance companies is too big to fail in our, in our research, meaning that you can't bring suit against the insurance companies. Uh, we've talked to, I've talked to a slew of attorneys. The only thing they can tell me was good luck, good luck. They didn't want to get involved with the case. Uh, they felt that the insurance companies, you can't sue them in state court because particularly they have, uh, they have a heavy lobby presence when it comes to state judges, uh, state representatives, uh, politicians. And it's like they are, they have monopolized, uh, the rating system. They have, it's, it, it, it's it's a, it's a, it's a, for uh, for me. It's more so uh, the fox gun hen house. Okay. Me, well, let me just come back to my question. Any other cases besides Schaefer's one? Schaefer's one. In terms of that, have yes, ever sir. you believe upheld this kind of case? When it comes to discriminatory, discriminatory practices, not. In my research, I haven't found okay. a case. Okay, just one moment. I need to speak to one of my law clerks, and then I'm going to give Mr. Kish an opportunity. All right, thank you, Mr. Kish. Uh, yes, I was just going to say how I have an example of the um, how uh, unfair it is, and it, or how we're not receiving uh, uh, reasonable rates. Uh, just for me in Detroit, I've lived in here my whole life. Um, they wanted to charge me for regular no fault policy for some twenty and a twenty and thirty year old vehicle, ten thousand dollars. Over ten thousand dollars. That's over half of my annual income, and this is for no fault. So it's gotten to the point where uh, something's got to give. So that's why I said, "Hey, I." What's, what's your? Have you? Do you have a driver's license? Yes. Have you ever had an accident? Yes. Have you my ever uh, been ticketed? Yes. Okay. Um, Do you think those things should affect your rates? Uh, I, all those points or whatever have been off my records clean. My, I, I mean, in the past I've had 
action. But you would agree that those are legitimate considerations in setting rates? Uh, I believe not to that extreme. Now, do, you, do you understand that the insurance companies, and I'm not, I'm not playing my violin for the insurance companies in terms of their profits, but you understand that they do need to make a profit? Absolutely. Okay. All right. Anything you want to, any further light you want to shed on this? And I, I compliment you as well, Mr. Kish. I think you're very well spoken, and I'm very passionate about what you, Thank you believe in. The, what's you. before this court is not whether I agree with you or not. It, what's before this court is whether you have a cognizable cause of action that can be pursued in this court, whether it's properly pleaded, whether the law supports what you're asking for. That's what's ultimately before the court. And uh, sometimes, regardless of which way my heartstrings may pull me, the law will pull me where it pulls me, and I'm going to decide this case on the law. Um, and it's not a question of who I like better or who I favor or anything else. It's a question of letting the law lead me because that's what I was sworn to do. So I, I hope you understand that. Absolutely. Okay. Anything further you want to say, Mr. Kish? That the, the Shavers versus Attorney General, if uh, just uh, reading some uh, parts of that, it's just it's saying exactly what we're saying. And uh, to quote Ray, and we have a few things highlighted, but you, you're familiar with it. So, you okay. know, that's the that's our main uh, thing that we can go on now because of the their immunity. It's the only avenue we have. We're trying to do whatever we can, you know. All right. Well, I will take a hard look at that case. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, docket number 45 is taken under advisement. The court will issue a report and recommendation. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm able to. Yeah, very briefly, because I have other events coming after this. Your Honor, um, in terms of. Uh, on docket 45. The administrative process. Okay. Uh, there is no uh, mechanism uh, to address the discriminatory actions um, for as a private right of action uh, under the Constitution there's no uh, process uh, to address that grave violation when it comes to discriminatory practices of the whole rating scheme Okay, well, in addition to what I said, Mr. Smith, you understand the court's also going to have to address a fairly major issue that's been raised by every defendant, which is standing. Yes, That sir. is Article Three standing to bring such a lawsuit. So uh, all that will be under advisement. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. All right, so docket number 45 is taken under advisement. A report and recommendation will be issued. That leaves us with... As far as motions to dismiss go, docket number 46, which is Progressive's motion to dismiss. And I think I get the gist of it, but you came all the way here and you probably want to say something. <laughs> so please identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Judge Mike Farrell, uh, on behalf of Progressive Casualty. Uh, the only thing I would add, Your Honor, is that... Can you get a little uh, closer, please? Sure. Um, the only thing I would add, Your Honor, is that... Um, with Your Honor having stricken the civil action brief, the arguments both in the joint defense motion and in our separate motion are even stronger than they were to begin with, which in my opinion, unsurprisingly, was quite strong. Um, and beyond that, Your Honor, I do not believe that our separate motion was ever opposed. Thank you. Unless Thank you. Your Honor, questions. Uh, no, I think I got that one. <laughs> you're, you're, so the basic argument is we haven't written a policy in Michigan in 15 years. That's what I got out of it. That's what we wanted to convey. Right? Okay, I got that. All right, any response, Mr. Smith? Why uh, should Progressive be in this case? Uh, progressive is um, Progressive. Your Honor, uh, some of these companies are insulated uh, with uh, assumed names. Um, is Progressive Auto Insurance, Progressive Corporation, uh, Progressive Casualty, insurance, um, we feel that they are all one entity operating under different assumed names. Um, progressive Insurance is a major uh, underwriter uh, in the state of Michigan, uh, whether they're using Progressive Casualty Insurance, 
but it is our understanding that it is one corporation. Okay, but they've said in their, and you're sort of blending into your motion to amend the complaint here to change the name of Progressive, but in their response to the motion to amend your complaint, which is docket number 63, they've, uh, that your motion is docket number 63, they've indicated that changing that name doesn't do anything it, because they, they still don't have any. You can look it up online. It shows you which companies have written policies and haven't in Michigan or are writing them now or not. And so what well, well, showing have you made that Progressive under uh, any assumed name or otherwise is writing policies in Michigan? You had that opportunity. Well, Your Honor, uh, we feel that Progressive uh, Insurance or Progressive Corporation, uh, whatever name uh, they choose to use as far as uh, uh, ending, uh, as far as casualty or whatever, we feel that Progressive Insurance is a major uh, underwriter of writing auto insurance policies with a no-fault or a conference collision policy, sir. Is I'm saying that the name is progressive, whatever, whatever other name they choose to um, end their name progressive with, we feel that progressive insurance is a major underwriter for all the policies in the state of Michigan, sir. Well, okay, I know you, you, you feel that, but either they are or they aren't. They, and they are, and also there may be separate Entities. It's not just a question of assumed names. You haven't made a showing to me that it's an assumed name, have you? Uh, well, no, I haven't. But okay. So if it's a separate but, corporation, you have to name the right corporation, but, even if it sounds a lot like it, right? <laughs> but but we feel it's all one corporation, Your Honor, sir. We feel that Progressive Auto Insurance uh, have many uh, different uh, titles added to it. But it is our understanding that Progressive Auto Insurance or Progressive Progressive Insurance. Progressive Insurance Company, uh, Progressive Casual Insurance is one corporation, sir. Okay. All right, Mr. Kish, anything you want to add? Yeah, I mean, that's common knowledge, just progressive. People hear that word, it's a pretty popular name. And so naturally, when you say progressive, you know. Okay, you'd agree with me, though, that if even if there is some entity named progressive writing policies in Michigan, the correct entity needs to be named. I'm not talking about an assumed name. I'm talking about a corporate name because, well, well, you know, there could be as we, Your Honor, uh, progressive auto insurance, progressive insurance, uh, progressive casualty insurance, uh, to, to us, in our understanding, it's one company, sir. It's one entity. It's one organization. It was Progressive Incorporated. Uh, it is one entity as far as uh, how we uh, pursue uh, as an animal as a defendant. In our understanding, it's one corporation, one company. Okay. All right. Well, um, docket number 46, Progressive's motion to dismiss is taken under advisement. The court will issue report and recommendation. Uh, that leaves us with the motions to amend. There are now uh, two of them that I docketed for today, but there's actually three of them, and I'll take them all up. Um, but I want to ask Mr. Smith first. Docket number 77 uh, is styled as an amended complaint, but the court has never given you leave to file an amended complaint. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, is that meant to just be an exhibit to one of your pending motions to amend, or were you intending to actually file that? And if so, well, let me, why don't you ask that, answer that question first. Uh, in reference to the uh, progressive amendment? Oh, there's also docket number 64. Docket number 64 is entitled, Amendment to original complaint. I note that it was filed right after docket number 63, which is a motion for leave to amend. And then docket number 77 is called amended complaint, which was filed 
looks like the same day as docket number 74, a motion to amend the original complaint. What I'm trying to figure out is were those filings meant to be exhibits of your showing the complaints that you proposed to file if the motions to amend were granted, or were you just telling me that these are your amended complaints and this is now what we live by? Uh, they were to uh, complement the original complaints. Sir. All right. So they're essentially proposed. You're, you're telling the court that those two, uh, docket number 77 and docket number 64, are just proposed amended complaints? To reflect the original complaint. As, right. But as, you're just proposing those if the court grants you motion to leave. Is that correct? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm going to um, – I have read each of your three uh, motions to amend. They're straightforward, and I don't need any arguments uh, – argument on them. Uh, but I am going to issue rulings on them. Docket number 51, motion to amend count three Sherman Act complaint. Um, is going to be denied without prejudice because it states that plaintiffs are pro se. It's been admitted today, and it's clear on the record that they're without attorneys, and yet it claims to be by and through Mr. Smith, Mr. Ray Smith, who signs on behalf of all, including the Americans uh, for Reform. There's no right to file such a complaint uh, on behalf of all of these over Mr. Smith's signature nor to file any motions on behalf of other plaintiffs, uh, because that would constitute practicing law without a license. Um, further, the, the proposal in docket number 51 is to represent a, quote, poverty class, close quote. Uh, Mr. Smith is not an attorney and is not appropriate to be appointed as class action counsel. Um, Further, uh, it is, and th on those bases alone, uh, the motion is denied. But the court will further note the likelihood that the proposed amendment, even if properly formed, would be futile for lack of standing. See docket entry number 56 at 12. Further, it is likely that the insurance defendants, uh, the 14th, any 14th Amendment claim made against them would be futile because they are not state actors. It's also likely that the antitrust claims, if any survive at this point, because it's no longer clear to me whether they were in the brief or in the actual pleading, um, would likely be futile. It's also likely that any Sherman Act claims against the state government would be futile under Parker v. Brown. It's also likely that standing is lacking, and for that reason, the proposed amended complaint would be futile. Uh, so I see the likelihood of futility, but beyond that, the plaintiff cannot file the complaints in their present form on behalf of others. That is Mr. Smith. Likewise, and so that motion is denied without prejudice. Likewise, docket number 63 is denied without prejudice. This is the motion to amend to correct the name of defendant progressive. It suffers from the same deficiencies, which is Mr. Smith purporting to act on behalf of others. Um, and it likely would be futile as well because of uh, being unable to overcome the problem of progressive 
the issue of progressive not writing policies in Michigan, although the court will be looking at that under advisement with respect to the dispositive motions. Likewise, that's denied without prejudice. And docket number 74 is likewise denied without prejudice because it suffers from the same deficiencies. It's a motion to amend to add L.A. insurance. But again, Mr. Smith cannot act on behalf of others. The court cannot accept that. Um, the motion itself refers to the class action, but there is no class action. And Mr. Smith cannot represent the class. And for the reasons I stated with respect to the other motions, it would likely be futile. These motions are denied without prejudice. The court, uh, well, plaintiffs, if they can put them in proper form, uh, could seek to amend the complaint in these ways in the future if this case survives the pending motions to dismiss. However, the court is going to leave in place the stay that I've already imposed until the court issues a definitive ruling on the motions to dismiss. When I say definitive ruling, I don't mean my report and recommendations. I will be issuing report and recommendation, reports and recommendations, after which there will be an opportunity of 14 days in which to object to whatever I have recommended. And then Judge Goldsmith, the district judge, will take up either to consider my report and recommend my reports and recommendations without objections or to consider objections that have been filed, and he will then issue the definitive rulings as to those dispositive motions. But until then, the case will remain uh, stayed, except as to what I've ordered. There will be no discovery. And, uh, and if the case should survive the motions to dismiss, uh, then um, a plaintiff may uh, seek further leave from the court to uh, plaintiff or plaintiffs. I know we've got at least two plaintiffs, I guess, um, to amend the pleadings as necessary, but the court's not going to entertain any further motions in that regard. Um, one moment. Rather than strike docket numbers 64 and 77, which are the amended complaints that were filed in the docket, in light of Mr. Smith's explanation that those were the proposed amended complaints that accompany his motions to amend, the court will um, clarify on the docket that that's what they are. They're essentially exhibits to his motions to amend. They are not pleadings in and of themselves, and they're not accepted as pleadings by the court. One moment. One further thing we need to do to deal with, which is, and if memory serves me, it's docket twenty one, but I'm gonna look. It's not. You find it. Stock at number 35, apparently I somehow knew it was a multiplier of 7. Um, the notice of voluntary dismissal of defendant Transamerica casualty. Does Transamerica have representation here today? I don't remember. Okay. The court notes that, that uh, well, first of all, the court uh, set a schedule by which people could file or Parties could file objections to the dismissal of Transamerica, and the court notes that no objections have been filed. 
However, the court is concerned because the notice of voluntary dismissal is signed only by Mr. Smith. Mr. Kish, are you aware of this notice of voluntary dismissal of defendant Transamerica Casualty Insurance Company? No, I'm not. Okay. Does anyone happen to have a clean copy of it? Perhaps you do, Mr. Smith. Not in my presence, sir. Okay. Well, let me tell you, Mr. Kish, Mr. Smith has filed a document which he signed purportedly on behalf of himself, yourself, Mr. Kish, Mr. Archie, Mr. Holmes, and Americans for Reform, voluntarily dismissing Transamerica Casualty Insurance Company with each party that is the plaintiffs and Transamerica to bear their own costs. And I see one of the defense counsel is going to show you a copy right now. You see docket number 35, Mr. Kish? Yeah, I see it. I don't have time to read it, but I'm looking at it. Ray signed it. Okay. Well, do you agree with Mr. Smith that Transamerica should be dismissed? Yes. All right. Okay. The court is going to grant that motion because the only two parties who have signed the complaint have either stated in writing or stated on the record of this court that they have no objection and no defendant or other party has filed an objection. And so they will be dismissed. If I need to do a report and recommendation, I'll do it that way. But at any rate, it would be appropriate to dismiss them under those circumstances. Those are the issues that the court is aware of that I needed to address. And this is set for a status conference. I think we've dealt with a lot of status today. But is there anything further that the court needs to be aware of from anyone at this time? Not from the defense, Your Honor. Okay. Mr. Smith? Not on the merits. We're not going to argue the case. But anything that I need to address that you think I haven't addressed? Well, we're still reflecting back on the state action and the state actors. Can I address that? No, we're beyond that. That's on the merits. Any housekeeping matters we need to talk about? Anything, any motion that I haven't addressed or ruling that I haven't made that I could have made today? The issue of LA insurance. Well, I've already denied the motion to add them by amended complaint without prejudice. You may seek to add them if this case can survive the current pending motions to dismiss. But until then, they may not be added. Okay. Anything, Mr. Kish? No, that's about it. All right. Well, thank you all very much. And I'd say have a nice weekend, but we're not quite there yet. So some of you have a long way to travel to get back. Thank you all for your enlightening argument. And those will be the rulings of the court. And others that have been taken under advisement will be issued later. Court is adjourned.